Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John the Baptist went into all the region around the Jordan, St. Luke tells us, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And although his father, Zechariah, had been a priest at the temple in Jerusalem, John preached without any authorization. He baptized without any call from the priests and Levites in Jerusalem. And this, that's part of what led many people to think that he himself was the Messiah. They also may have thought that he was the Messiah because of his message of what he was doing. The Lord had said through Ezekiel in his 36th chapter, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Lord had also said through the prophet Zechariah in his 13th chapter, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And since these prophets spoke of the time before the Messiah would come, when the Messiah would come, it's natural for the people that heard John to wonder if he, in fact, was the Christ. Since he preaches without authorization from the priests and Levites in Jerusalem, they send a fact-finding commission out to Beth Abara, beyond the Jordan, where John was doing these things, and they send this delegation with one question. Who are you? And John simply confesses, with no equivocation, I am not the Christ. And so with that out of the way, then they go down their list of who he could be. Are you Elijah? They ask, because the Lord had spoken 400 years prior to this, when he spoke to Israel the last time through a prophet, the prophet Malachi, he said, Behold, I will send the Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, since Elijah didn't die, but was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind with a chariot of fire, the Jews assumed that that meant that Elijah himself would come back to earth and probably destroy the enemies of the Jews, just as he had called fire down upon the enemies of Israel at one point, just as he had slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal. But John denies all of this with a simple, I am not. He wasn't Elijah the Tishbite, and he was rather the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, we heard last week in Matthew 11, Jesus say, if you are willing to receive it, he is the Elijah who was to come. And in Matthew chapter 17, he says, Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. This doesn't mean that John is lying, of course. This means that Jesus wants us to understand John's confession through the words of the angel that spoke to his father before he was born. In Luke 1, 17, where the angel told Zechariah, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John came in the spirit and power of Elijah, meaning that the Holy Spirit would work mightily and effectively through John, just as he had Elijah, to bring the people of Israel back to the religion of their fathers, back to the ancient faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that faith which heard God's word, believed it, and was counted as righteousness. Well, he's not Elijah, according to their understanding, so they ask him if he is the prophet. Most likely the prophet foretold by the Lord in Deuteronomy 18.18 18, when he says, I will raise up for them, the people of Israel, a prophet like you, he's speaking to Moses, from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak, them, speak to them all that I command him. It seems that the Jews thought that this prophet would be another Messiah, someone who would be like Moses, another lawgiver, a civil ruler. But to this, John just simply answers, no. 
having run through their list of possibilities of who they think John could or should be, they finally ask him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? And he responds with the words that we heard from Isaiah the prophet just a moment ago, the 40th chapter. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He's not the Christ. He is the voice of the one preparing the way of the Christ. He's not Elijah, but he is the one who comes in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn people away from their sins towards faith in Christ. He is not the prophet. No, he's a prophet, all right. He's more than a prophet, Jesus says. The voice who prepares the way of the Lord by preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And unlike all of the prophets that came before him, he not only gets to foretell the Messiah, but he gets to announce the Messiah as a present reality. He tells the delegation from Jerusalem, There stands one among you, whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, who is already ahead of me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to untie. That, he says, is how close the Messiah is. And since he's that close, prepare the way of the Lord. John's preaching prepared people for the first advent of the Messiah when he came in human flesh to make satisfaction for the sins of the world. John's preaching, his confession that we hear today, this testimony is written and recorded for our learning as well. Not just so that we believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but so that we too are prepared for the second advent of the Messiah when he comes on the last day in glory to judge the living and the dead. For though John is dead, he still preaches repentance through the scriptures so that all who hear his preaching in faith might escape from the wrath to be revealed when Christ comes again in glory. For the way that John told the Israelites to prepare for the first advent of the Messiah is the same preparation that we are enjoined to do in his, for his second advent. And what did the prophets say? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places made smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Just as John's hearers were to do this in their hearts, so are we to do this in ours. And what do we see exalted in our own hearts? What's the highest good that we seek instead of God? Financial security, companionship, honor, glory, popularity, peace and quiet. Whatever it is that is exalted in the heart must be brought low. Whether it's a tall mountain or a rolling hill. Exalting the things of this life, when we do that, that means the reverse for the things of God. When we exalt our desires into mountains and hills, God's will for us becomes a valley. And that's what must be lifted up. Not only that, but the crooked places in our hearts. The sins that we secretly try to hold on to, try to tame and domesticate. Those places must be straightened. And the desire for sin must be removed. The rough places, the anger, the jealousy, the entitlement, the self-pity, and whatever else within our hearts is rough by our sinful nature must be made smooth because the glory of the Lord is coming and will be revealed when Christ returns. And all of this, all of this is simply repentance. First, that we acknowledge our sin for what it is and that we confess it as such. And second, that we believe the gospel. That for Christ's sake, God forgives the sins of all who are penitent. And third, that in that faith, which trusts 
God's promise in the gospel. A new man, a new woman arises to walk before God in righteousness and purity each day. For this preparation is not a one-time thing. It's a daily activity. It's a way of life. For within the human heart, there are things that we exalt and make into the highest good. So that if we only have that thing, then we have everything else that's good in life and all that we need. Each day we're tempted to put aside God's word and listen to the world's word, to our own word, to our own thinking instead, exalting our thoughts while God's thoughts revealed in his word, well, those really aren't what we think we need for the day. And each day there are those crooked thoughts, those desires and impulses of the flesh that if we allow to reign over us, then we behave crookedly towards God and ourselves and those around us. To this crookedness, we must apply the corrective of contrition and the gospel, and so then by that faith and the forgiveness of those sins, align those thoughts with God's thoughts that he reveals in the scripture. Every day there are rough patches, rough places that need to be smoothed, because if we don't smooth those rough places, then they will give birth to sin. John, the voice crying in the wilderness, tells us once again to make straight the way of the Lord. And he also then shows us the place from where we get the strength to do just that. For it does not come from within ourselves, but it comes from the preaching and baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The daily power to prepare the way of the Lord to make straight his ways in our hearts. God gives that to us in baptism. Since baptism is that which Isaiah, or excuse me, Ezekiel foretold, the sprinkling of clean water, which gives us new and clean hearts. By washing us in holy baptism, God forgave our sins, cleansed us from their guilt, and created in us new hearts and new spirits. John baptized by the command of the Lord because the life of preparation for the advent of Christ, both the first advent in his flesh and the second advent in glory, both are the same. The way of preparation, the life of preparation, is the baptismal life. We live in our baptisms by daily drowning the old Adam with its sinful desires and thoughts. Contrition. We daily live in our baptism then by rising into new life as new creatures, fully forgiven, sins detached from us, consciences cleansed, to live before God in righteousness and purity that day, rejoicing in the Lord with hearts and minds guarded by the peace of Jesus. And we wait for the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ preparing his way, making straight the paths in our hearts, living each day by what he gave to us in our baptisms, by what he continues to give us in our baptism. Repentance, faith in the forgiveness of sins, and new life. Amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.